how do you create a broken water cycle? And whether it's a pasture, a conventional tilled cornfield, or the hotel parking lot, it all comes from the same place, the lack of vegetative cover. Or we, sometimes I throw in, or the whole continent of Australia. Australia is one huge broken water cycle. And it comes from a lack of vegetative cover. What happens if we don't have vegetative growth out here? We have a diminished root growth. If you have diminished root growth, organic matter will be declining, not increasing. If organic matter is declining, you're going to have poor soil structure. It's going to collapse, become a compacted soil. When we have a compacted soil, we have reduced infiltration rate. If we don't have water going into the soil, we have reduced water holding capacity, which means we can't grow vegetative cover. Where does the water go? It runs off. This is the repeating downward cycle that happens every time we short ourselves on the vegetative cover, it's going to send us down the path to increased runoff, erosion, soil depletion, all of those things. We've talked about these pictures, you get it. We've gone now back to 1937 research. You see why I quit academia? All the good stuff is done years ago. We just don't apply what we already know. So this is conservation bulletin number five from the University of Nebraska. Three different pasture conditions, three inches of simulated rainfall, so it's put on through a sprinkler in 90 minutes. Poor pasture, twice the recommended stocking rate, continuously grazed. 50% ground cover. When they put the water on in late July, it was about two inches tall. 50% of the soil is just bare dirt. This 50% cover includes the living material and the litter that's out there. So 50%, this isn't living cover, 50% of the ground is just flat out bare. Three inches of rain, 75% runoff. Only three quarters of an inch actually infiltrated into the soil. The rest is gone. Recommended stocking rate, continuous grazing, 75% ground cover, so 25% bare soil. About half the water ran off. Long history of rotational grazing, mixed native warm season, cool season plant community clipped to two inches when they put the water on and the material raked off so it's just the stubble out there. It isn't, you know, mowed down material out there. Only 5% bare dirt in a prairie clipped down at two inches. Put the water on, just over 10% runoff. So about 2.6, 2.7 inches infiltrated into the soil. This is 90 minutes. That soil is taking water in at a rate of two inches an hour. That's actually pretty good for soils to do, especially when you look at what happens in certain situations. This is a rainfall simulator demonstration, and one of these uh, pasture walks, we're going to have a, one of these demonstrations. If you've not seen one, they're totally cool. They're also totally eye-opening on what water dynamics responds to in terms of our surface management. I'm not going to go through all these. We'll just look at the two ends. The front jug, and the way they do these, they cut a uh, four-inch thick slab of soil and fit it into that tray. And the trays can be set either flat or at any angle to simulate slope. A sprinkler runs across the top of this. The front jug captures surface runoff. The back jug captures infiltration. Here is a tilled bare crop soil. And I don't remember how much water they actually put on across there. But you can see the runoff jug is totally full. There's only about an inch of water in the infiltration jug. Three inches of, you know, three inches of rain in 30 minutes, big deal, whoopie doo typical Midwest thunderstorm, you might get four of those a week in some particular week. Virtually nothing infiltrating through the profile to recharge the soil runoff. Perennial pasture, inch and a half of runoff in the jug up front, clean enough, you could drink that water if you wanted to. The back jug, the infiltration jug, completely filled. We can recharge the soil profile with water, 
We can minimize runoff. The runoff we get is essentially clean. That's a heck of a difference. So to create an effective water cycle, it's just exactly the opposite of breaking it. First step is you've got to maintain vegetative cover. Appropriate litter layer on the soil, and the only way you'll create litter on the soil surface is by having leftover yield up here to turn into litter. I will have no fear of wasting grass because it has to come down here. It's not wasted. It's an integral part of the water cycle. We do these things by balancing use and recovery periods. The shorter our use period, the more tightly we can manipulate these things. The longer the recovery period, the more forage we can create on top, if that's what our objective is. We want to build organic matter, because that's where we get soil structure, infiltration, storage capacity, avoid animal concentration points, because that's where we're most likely to bear the ground and create an opportunity for erosion and compaction. So that's how you build a healthy water cycle. Carrying capacity. You saw this picture earlier on. This, this is our pasture. This is on a ranch five miles down the road from us. One of the key things about sprinkler irrigation is you never want to see water running on the surface. The whole idea with a pivot, the sizing of the nozzling, the rate at which you run it, is so that you maximize infiltration. If there's water running on the surface under a sprinkler, you're doing something wrong. In this case, they're doing a whole lot of things wrong. No vegetative cover, diminished root growth, collapsed soil structure, all of that. Five miles away, up the road, is carrying capacity only dependent on your environment? No. It's the combination of management and environment. They generate somewhere between 120 and 140 stock days per acre off of this. Our 10-year average is 270. We have been over 300 in good years. So management is huge when it comes to carrying capacity. When the ground is dried out or the vegetation is dried out and you have bare ground, most of the water that goes to the soil is just evaporated back out of it. Very little is actually used by the plants through transpiration to create new feed. When you bear the ground, this is where you go. When we keep the ground covered, keep it cooler. And we, in the West, we, of course, can have places like this and like that just across the fence from each other. The difference between irrigating and not irrigating. The difference in soil temperature between a green covered field and a dry brown field at mid-afternoon at two inches can very easily be 20 degrees. I've seen it higher, seen it lower, but generally we think in terms of a 20 degree temperature differential at two inches between those two types of cover. 20 degrees higher, water is evaporating out in a hurry. Here, the majority of our water is used for plant growth, so we're creating new cow feed, and we minimize evaporation. Huge difference in water use efficiency. Now, you're, you can't control when you get rain, so on those occasions when you get rain, you want to get as much of that into the soil and hold it in the soil to grow plants, not just evaporate out and disappear. This is our oldest son, Ian. He was uh, managing a place in South Missouri in the drought of 2012, down by West Plains. They've had a weather station at West Plains for 140 years. 2012 was the driest year in 140 years of weather records around West Plains. Normal, I took this picture July 19th. Normally, this would be, you know, just green fields of fescue. This is what he had to work with. Uh, he's on 3,500 acres with 1,300 adult bovines. 600 of those were beef cows, and then he had 700 dairy heifers and dry cows. That's already twice the normal, more than twice the normal stocking rate for that area. He was doing mob grazing. And since he was doing it and, you know, told me what he was doing, I can say mob grazing. He did have, you know, mixed stock. He did eventually have to take the dairy heifers out because they couldn't sustain themselves on the same management he was running the beef cows. So he, he had the, the dairy cattle in a separate herd 
and he didn't run them quite as aggressively as this. He ended up most of the summer moving about six times a day. So every two hours he's moving this herd. It's taking down electric fence, leapfrogging it up. 600 cows, two and a half, and two and a half acres is what he was putting them on for two to three hours. This is what it looked like when they were done. A uh, lot of material, they, they've eaten some, but there's a lot of material on the surface. There's actually very little bare ground out there. It, they did get around the 1st of August um, 1.6 inches of rain and his pastures immediately greened up and started growing. The neighbors who had started feeding hay in June had their cows running on the entire pasture because, you know, there's this idea that if there's a drought, we'll open up everything and let them pick. Yeah, every time a little blade of grass gets that tall, four cows are out there eating it off. Those neighbors fed hay until June of 2013. They fed hay for 12 continuous months. Ian, they destocked by about 20%, so he ended up with about 1,050 head on the 3,500 acres, stockpiled enough pasture through and following the worst drought in 140 years, fed no hay, grazed through the entire winter with 80% of the herd because management does make a difference. And his management was focused on putting cover down on that ground, insulating that ground with dead material so that when a little bit of rain came, he could capitalize on it. So controlling the time spent on one area allows not just the pasture plants to recover, but the soil, the water profile there, the shorter you make that time of exposure of the pasture to the livestock, the more everything else has a chance to flourish.